excited. Minister Wayne is an amazing brother who has been uh, in uh, just deep partnership with our church and the larger Oakland community uh, for pretty much his whole life. Where We met in the course of doing our uh, gun violence prevention work and has an amazing story. He's preached a number of times here. Some of you, this may be your first time hearing him preach, but I'm so excited uh, since he's last uh, preached, I believe he has formally started his own uh, or took the helm of a nonprofit called the Oakland Leadership Center, Oakland Impact Center in East Oakland. And he has been doing amazing work to mentor young men and fathers. They have multiple groups every week in East Oakland, mentoring young men and fathers on uh, just the, the vicissitudes and journeys of being, uh, uh, you know, men and fathers in this culture, in this climate. And so uh, he is also stepping into leading and providing more leadership with our men's ministry here. And of course, all of you that are men after church, 11 o'clock service, we're gonna be hanging out and you'll get a chance to interact a little bit more with him and with us. So I'm excited to welcome him uh, to the pulpit to preach the word of God this morning. So stand to your feet, everybody, and let's put our hands together. Let's welcome the spokesperson for the King of Glory, Minister Wayne. Good morning. I, um, if you haven't heard me before, I'll, I'll warn you, I'm very transparent. <laughs> I believe leadership, one of the greatest gifts you can offer is transparency, um, especially in the church. I know the people that impacted my life the most was some people that was in a leadership position that was very transparent with me. Because so many times, people see us come up and go down and lead and leave, and they don't know we struggle. And the best gift you can offer sometimes is just saying, hey, I struggle. And so I'm going to start by the Holy Spirit already leading me, and I just let him lead me because he's been leading me the whole way, and I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for him. But as I sat there today, I'm going to invite you into this transparent moment. I didn't know we was doing the panel. So you can imagine in all of my preparation for today, I had my own little timeline. And I started to worry. Am I going to have enough time to do everything I want to do? And, and God had to take his moments like he always does with me because I've taken time to cultivate a relationship with the Holy Spirit so that he can have access to me at all times. And, 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 and something crazy happened as I closed my eyes and just tried to meditate for a minute to get rid of this weary. He showed me two of the worst times of my life. And I'm not talking about two times that somebody did something to me. I'm talking about two times I did something to people. And in this moment, I'm like, God, what are we doing this for right now? I'm, I'm, I, that's how I talk to him. He's my father. And he quickly had to get me together and say, son, I'm not trying to condemn you. I'm trying to remind you. He said, I'm trying to remind you that I am the one that brought you from there to here. And if I brought you from there to here, you ain't got nothing to worry about right now. This is a small thing. This is what you was called to do. We sung today and said, it's not about me, it's about him. That's so much of my sermon today. It's a surrender. And I just love being transparent because I just feel like we don't do that enough. And in leadership, I do believe, I challenge a lot of the leaders that I'm around. I hear what you're teaching and I, I hear what you're talking about. But if you're not walking in some level of transparency with those that God has assigned to you, you're not doing them the best justice. Today, what God put on my heart as we have started this journey in igniting gifts, he told me as his son to make sure that we're prepared for the gifts that will be ignited. 
Because one thing I've come to understand is so many times we ask for things that we're not prepared to receive. And so we have to be also in a posture where when we're asking God to ignite the gift, we have to be aligned and ready for what comes with that. And so I'm going to try to unpack some of the stuff that God put on my heart and some of the ways he took in me in my own journey and some of the things he's shown me, some of the reasons, some of the preparation, some of the purpose, and some of the practice of igniting gifts and what comes with that. I want to start with a story about a young man named Michael. I love stories where God shows up because sometimes they preach more than any word you can ever tell somebody. Because we can always relate to real stories and sometimes we surprise how people's stories go. So there's a story about this young boy named Michael. I'm gonna just give you a little bit of his history. Slide one. He was known to be an extremely sensitive child who suffered from severe depression. Some of this came because his family also experienced many levels of abuse and racial discrimination in his hometown. 1941, Michael, he jumped out of the second story window of his family's home at the age of 12 in an alleged suicide attempt. He allegedly attempted suicide after he was traumatized and overwhelmed with the guilt over the death of his grandmother, which he thought he played the part in. The incident was said to be his second suicide attempt before the age of 13. Now, if I would pause right there, Michael's life seems like he's headed for destruction. But can somebody say, but God? Anybody else have but God moments? I got a lot of them. We move on to see in high school he was skipped his first year and his last year. Some of the stories say it was 11th grade. Some say it was 12th grade. Says he never graduated, but he went straight to college. But God. 1944, second slide, please. Got it. 1944, at the young age of 15, he enrolls into Morehouse College, which is Morehouse University now. 1948, he earns a sociology degree at the age of 19. Now, remember, we're talking about the same young boy who at the age of 13, by the age of 13, had tried to commit suicide twice. 1950, 1953, at the age of 24, he married, but had to spend the wedding night in a funeral home owned by a friend because honeymoon suites weren't available to black people at this time. 1955, he earns his PhD at the age of 26. Isn't this amazing story? Michael. The little boy named Michael had so much purpose. Let me, unfinish, let me finish unpacking this. Do you know who this little boy named Michael is? It's the man we call Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King wasn't born to Martin. He was born to Michael. The story says he never even legally changed his name. But we know what this man went on to do and how he changed the, tra the trajectory of our history. He's one of the only people that's not a president that has a holiday in the United States. And he's the only person that has a holiday that's, sep that's celebrated in, in the United States and in other countries. 
Michael, suicide, twice, before 13. How do you connect this, Brother Wayne? Michael had a gift he was carrying. And the enemy attacked it early. And in so many of our lives, we wonder why we're being attacked. And we wonder why our 13 and our 12-year-old and our 11-year-old boys and girls are being attacked. But I just came to tell you that it's because they have a gift and the enemy doesn't want that gift to ever come to light. Let's change the way we look at our youth. Because the enemy know what they carry. Just like he knows what you're carrying. I know there's somebody that came into here today that's under attack. I know there's multiple people that's under attack. You're not being attacked because it's about you. It's about what you carry. Yes, yes. The enemy didn't want Dr. King to get where he got so he could change the way we see things, so he can have his own holiday. He didn't want that, but God had a plan. And we need to understand that no matter what, if we continue to press through with the ways of the Holy Spirit and everything that he gives us, we got a gift that we can bring to the world that can change things. Yeah. Let me finish some of Dr. King's story. One of the favorite parts of his story to me is the I have a dream speech. A lot of you might not know, but that I have a dream speech was not the speech that was meant to be. Uh, he has a, a great friend. And his friend that was on the podium that day, he tells a story and he says, Martin said, I'm gonna go up here and I'm going to talk for no longer than 10 minutes, and then I'll be done. But God had a different plan. Now, his friend that I'm talking about is Andrew Young. A lot of people know him. You see him in pictures. Dr. King is always with Andrew Young. And in, in an interview, Andrew Young talks about Dr. King coming to a place in his speech where it was about nine minutes or so, right between the nine and 10 minute mark, and he was pretty much done. And as you watch the video, you can actually see about a five to 10 minute pause before he transitions into the I Have a Dream speech. A lot of people think the I Have a Dream speech was the speech. No. He spoke for about nine to 10 minutes before the I Have a Dream speech ever came to light. The I Have a Dream speech was truly a move of the Holy Spirit. Andrew Young says in his interview, and I love this part because as we talk about igniting gifts, you need to have some people around you that's already ignited so they can, they can rub off on you and you can be ignited too. And there was a black woman, somebody say black women, always stepping up, always carrying us. You see the man has the movement, but the, the woman was the mouth. She spoke it into life. And back there, you listen to the video, I think that's her voice you can hear. But Dr. King kind of pauses after he gets to the end of his nine to 10 minute speech. And Andrew Young says, Mahalia Jackson yells out, tell him about the dream. <laughs> Check it out yourself. Because, see, she was in a circle, and they had already been talking about, the, he'd been telling them about this dream, but he hadn't told the world about this dream. And if you know Mahalia Jackson like I know Mahalia Jackson, Mahalia Jackson was full of the Holy Spirit. On fire. The young people would say Mahalia Jackson was lit. And Andrew, he says, 
But hell, you said, tell him about the dream. And that's when Martin started to talk about the dream. He never planned to talk about, I have a dream. But it was a friend that was close to him that was already, I, I know the Holy Spirit well enough, and Mahalia came to that thing with an assignment to deliver that voice. That's how God works. When he has something ignited and stirring up, I could just imagine her sitting there. Sometime I'm about to speak and I'm just sitting there and the spirit is just bubbling up inside of me. And I can't wait to deliver what he has because I know it's going to touch and change some lives. And I can just imagine Mahalia just sitting there saying, oh, if he give me, if he give me a second, I'm, I'm, God, I'm going to do it. And he, she spoke it. And that is now why we have the I have a dream speech. You got to be around some people that is carrying gifts, walking in their gifts, ignited in their gifts. But like I said, one of the things I want to talk about is how we come to a place where we understand that we're pursuing the gift. But how are we protecting the gift? How are we cultivating the gift? How are we preparing to receive the gift? Because one of the biggest things I see as I've come up in the church is the attack of the enemy surprises too many Christians. <laughs> and for me, I'm like, maybe it's because my past life and where I came from, but I see this fool far away. I have a discernment that I just can't, I can't, he, I can't take a chance with him sneaking up on me no more. And so we get excited about what God is asking us to do, but not excited about what he want to take us through to get there. And a lot of times we're not even an understanding there's a story about them telling this man that if he want to make a million dollars guaranteed in one year, he had to work 12 hours a day for 365 days. He wanted the million, but his body wasn't up for the journey. He still tried it. A lot of times, that's how we are. We're unaware of what we're being called into. And so we get excited about getting ignited, but not understanding the attacks that's about to come with that. Because the minute you tell God, use me, God. Use me, God. The enemy is sitting there and saying, I'm not having this transition happen. In the, in the interview, Andrew Young also said, the interviewer asked her, why do you think Dr. King made the transition. Why do you think he listened to Melia? And Andrew Young said, there's something in the black church that we call being moved by the spirit. What I love about watching the I Have a Dream speech is that you can see Dr. King reading his first nine to 10 minutes off of the pages. He gets to about eight minutes, and you can tell he's kind of finishing, and he's winding down, and this part he might not have practiced as much. But most of his thing, he's looking down at the paper. He's looking down at the paper, looking down at the paper. But oh my, when that I have a dream speech starts, his facial expressions start to change. Yeah. His body language starts to change. Yeah. He starts to get excited. There's no more paper. That's all Holy Spirit. And I say that because I, I think so many major moments happen in life that we have no idea that the Holy Spirit is all the major player. Yes. Not about us. Yes. Not about us. So as we move forward, before we go into the scripture, would you, would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, have your way. Thank you, Lord, for... They said, amazing assignment to serve you. Lord, I don't take it lightly that I get to do what I get to do in this capacity. Lord, I ask you to hide me behind your cross. 
so that I am lost and that your son and the Holy Spirit is gained. Lord, I know that there's change and transformation in your word. So I ask you, all of you and none of me, in Jesus' name. The first place that we'll go to in the word where I just want to show how just like Dr. King there was a transaction that happened. There was a shifting that happened. And what I've learned about walking with God and reading his word is most of the major moments that happen in the Bible and our lives, you'll see this major player. There'll be a shifting from flesh to spirit. And even watching Dr. King, if you heard me say, first he was reading from the paper, but then there was a shifting. And what I love about knowing how God shifts is there has to be an empty place for him to pour out his spirit. Dr. King was in a moment of five to ten seconds where it was like, I thought I would only take ten minutes, but I feel something keeping me here. And then Mahalia gave him what he needed. And I just want to take a little bit of time talking about the baptism of, of Jesus. Because it's very interesting to watch his interactions with John. And I've come to understand that that place of humility is always an invitation for the Holy Spirit, Spirit to just drop. Yeah. Dr. King could have not listened to Mahalia. But there was a place where whatever he received he was in such a place where he said, let me receive whatever God just gave me. As a speaker, I know most of the time when somebody yelling something, I'm not listening to what they're telling me to do. Sometimes it can be prideful. Sometimes I'm just sticking to the plan. But when the Holy Spirit is starting to move or trying to move for the edification of the body of Christ, for the revelation of the world. We have to be in this place of humility. And being in a place of humility takes practice. Intentional practice. Because it's not our natural nature. And so when we go to the word, I'll be reading from Matthew 3, 13 and 17. And the word, word reads, at that time, Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan River. He came to John and wanted John to baptize him. But John tried to stop him. John said, why do you come to me to be baptized? I should be baptizing you. Jesus answered, let it be this way for now. Key point right there. We should do all things that are right. So John agreed to baptize Jesus. Jesus was baptized and he came up out of the water. Heaven opened and he saw God's spirit coming down on him like a dove. And a voice spoke from the heaven. The voice said, this is my son. I love him. I am very pleased with him. Major moment that's connected to everything we're doing. And we talk about that place of humility. But if you want to receive the gifts that God has for you, a lot of times he will take you in the low place of the flesh to get you to the high place in the spirit. Jesus, Jesus was Jesus. 
And John was a baptizer of sinners. But when I read this, and God spoke to me, he said the mind state that my son had was, he came to John in his place of humility. And what he said, because what I had spoke to him was, John, I know what you see in the flesh. But my father has told me that you are in position to change my condition. Jesus' ministry was never the same after this. Right after this is when he was taken and tempted. And his ministry really just took off. And so many times before we actually get what God is going to do in our lives and what he's going to ignite in our lives, there will have to be a place of intentional humility. Some, sometime we miss this place of growth because it's not from the person that we think we, we should be receiving from. It's not in the place where we think we should be receiving from. It's not in the time that we think we should be receiving but as I've studied the Bible, I've come to learn that most of God's most amazing moments happen by crazy unseen encounters. Let's go talk to Mary. The An angel Gabriel shows up and tells her she's carrying a baby. Crazy unseen encounter. But it ignited a gift. Gave us the greatest gift ever. Mary had to say yes to be in, in a place of humility. Because what do you think her husband and the rest of the world was going to say? Let's go talk to Paul. Paul, literally riding on his high horse. And boom. Crazy unseen encounter to activate his gift. A lot of us don't like the crazy unseen encounters. It's the uncomfortable place. And if we be real, we actually run from them. But what would it look like if we start understanding what God is showing us in the Bible about most of his most amazing stories and we started to try to practice. God, show me the crazy unseen encounters that you need me to embrace so that I can see your face and so that I can cultivate this gift. Yes. For most of these moments to manifest, there has to be an exchange, like we said earlier, from flesh to spirit. Mary was just a young girl walking along. Paul was so fleshly, he was the one killing Christians. You talk about a place of humility. Paul, after being knocked off his horse, had to go be taken care of by people that was fearful of him. He, he, Ananias said, God, I heard about this dude. He a beast. <laughs> but even Ananias had to embrace that crazy unseen encounter yeah, yeah, yeah. to bring about the gift of Paul. We can't just talk about the gifts and get excited about the spiritual gifts and not understand that the journey that God is going to take us on as he cultivates the gifts. Yeah. And that's really what I want you to remember about today. Yeah. Is that we, as we continue to talk about walking and talking and moving in the spiritual gifts that God had for us, we have to understand that the cultivation stage ain't nice sometimes.
My mentor always tells me that humility is most time a qualification for God's exaltation. He talks to me about how, because he wants me to stay in this place. And I'm so thankful that God has chosen to place me around amazing men like Pastor Mike, Pastor Ben, where all of us know ain't no perfection in us. But when I talk about being humble and in places of humility, I love when my friends meet Pastor Mike. He don't even know this, but most of them be looking around like where Pastor Mike at. He walk in like that. And they're like, big dog, where Pastor Mike coming? I'm like, that Pastor Mike. Where's Pastor Mike? They looking for this dude to come in with the robe on and looking like Jesus. I mean, just glowing. And he walk in like that. That's a beautiful thing to me. Because in my work, people need to see people doing amazing things for God, carrying their gifts the greatest way, looking just like them. One of the most amazing things that can ever happen. But people see the glory of God on you, but they also see your humanity. Cultivating gifts. Jesus' obedience shows us when he says to John, I love this part. He says, let it be this way for now. Interesting. Very interesting. God spoke to me about that. Let it be this way for now. We should do all things that are right. And the way God broke this down for me to put in its simplest form is that Jesus spoke to the flesh of John and then he spoke to the spirit. He, in simplicity, he just said, John, let it, let it be just for now. Jesus knew this wasn't nothing about just for now. This was going to change the way we live. But he had to still speak to his humanity to get a place to speak to his spirit. And we need to learn from that. Because as God trusts us with his gift, we can't always just compounding on people and try and say, I'm trying to speak to your spirit. We have to be able to meet people where they are. Can you imagine John? He's like, if you look at the scriptures before, he was just talking about how amazing Jesus was. He said, I can't even carry his sandals. And now he's right in front of him saying, baptize me. John is like, man, this is, this is crazy. This ain't real. And Jesus knew how to speak to him, speak to his flesh, and then transition it to his spirit. And there was no dispute after that. John said, yes, I'll do it. What I also love about this scripture is that once the obedience is in place and we say yes to the way that God does it, so many times he's sitting right there saying, now I can trust you with the spirit. But let me tell you something about carrying this spirit. I've learned on my own, and one of the main things my mentor talks to me about when he talks to me about humility, he's been in ministry for 33 years, and he says, son, I've seen so many men go up, and God have to knock them down. You have to always be careful and be learning and be discerning and cultivating the gift. But this can only be done by way of the Holy Spirit. I love one of my favorite artists, Tasha Cobb. 
And she talks about her song, Fill Me Up. And it's crazy because I love God because I'm listening to the songs we sing and I'm like, this is just like the song I'm a reference. And her word says this, you provide the fire, I'll provide the sacrifice. You provide the spirit, I will open up inside. Fill me up. What happens here is she's saying, you provide the fire. Do you know the fire comes to burn things away? And then she says, I'll provide the sacrifice. What she's saying is, God, I'm offering you my flesh. Then she says, you provide the spirit after my flesh has been burned away and I've chosen to say yes to the sacrifice so that I may get the thing that you have for me. You provide the spirit, and I will open up inside. You know what's so interesting about this? As I, every time I listen to her song, when you're still full of the flesh, you can't even open up inside. It is not until the spirit gets a hold of you and tells you, I'm trying to do something new in you at all times. Oh, Lord, I wish we never get complacent with what God is trying to do in our lives. Because every time we get to one level, he's saying, I got more. And I know I want to be a part of a family and a a church that is always wanting more of God. So many times I'm praying about things that he tells me, son, you're shortchanging me. You, you, You need to pray bigger. I'm trying to do something way bigger than that. And on a few times that I've tried it, man, he show up like it's crazy. He shows up and he blows my mind. I've got to the point now where I'm crazy enough to just ask for the big stuff. But we have to understand that there's a position and a condition that we have to come to. I want to talk a little bit before we finish about the purpose of our gifts. Can you go to the next slide? The purpose of our gifts. The purpose of our gifts. In 1 Corinthians 12, 7, it reads, Something from the spirit can be seen in each person to help everyone. I think a lot of us struggle with even thinking we carry gifts. But I know who I used to be. And you would have never told me I was carrying nothing good. You would have never told me I would be standing here speaking to nobody. But as I started to get around some people who was ignited, and I started to trust God's process, and they started to tell me, God want to do some crazy stuff. He kept you for a reason. I started to believe some of this stuff. It started to be, it was crazy to me at first. I would say, man, you don't know who I am. You don't know what I've done. God wouldn't dare touch me with no assignments. But then I started to get in my word, people. And I realized everybody that he used was like me. They had a crazy story. He didn't use the people that was already big-headed. He used the people that would give him the biggest glory. Because he would have to pull them out of places and take them to higher places. He took David from being a little shepherd boy to being a king. He took Moses from being in the wilderness with his uh, uh, stepfather Jephro for 40 years and he used him to lead the children of Israel. He used Noah. And so all of us carry gifts. But we don't carry the gifts for us. Somebody say it's not about me. 
Somebody say, it's not about me. As I close, I want to just highlight this point. Because what I've come to see is when I think the gift is about me, God won't activate it like he will when I understand that it's about him. When I understand that it's about his people. The purpose of our gifts is for definitely for the edification of the kingdom of God. But it is also like, like Matthew. It is for us to be the salt and the light to the world. I feel like too many churches I see is just doing the edification of the kingdom part. We lock the gifts inside the house. But God is calling us to a place of recognition, a place of cultivation. So that he can take us to the world and show us off. But he needs us to know that it's not about us. And it's all about him and his people. I truly believe when we come to a place of humility and we say, God, fill me up until I overflow. You know, for a cup to be filled up with overflow, a lot of times it's not full. It got, it's empty. God loves an empty place, people. I, I, I'm a witness God loves the empty place. Oh, I wish we could understand just that point. Because when you come to understand that point, it'll change who you be around. It'll change places you go. It'll change things you look at. It'll change everything about you. Because you're saying, God, I don't want anything in in my place that is not of you. Because the world is offering us so much. That's not of God. And so I pray that the word that came forth today is a reminder. And we can say, God, I just want to be lit for you. But I hope we come to an understanding that to be lit for God, we have to be empty of flesh. I pray that the word touched somebody today. In Jesus' name, amen.